How can we create daily structures and routines that support writers? I'm Steph from Heinemann, and today on the podcast, we're joined by Heinemann author and Classroom Essentials series editor, Katie Woodray. We're also joined by Katherine Bomer and Corinne Ahrens, co-authors of the newest Classroom Essentials book, A Teacher's Guide to Writing Workshop Essentials, Time, Choice, Response. Guided by the research-based belief that children learn to write best when provided a predictable daily writing structure, Catherine and Corinne introduce the basics of writing workshop and suggest small, incremental steps towards implementing them. Here now is Katie Woodray. So I'm here today talking with Catherine Bomer and Corinne Ahrens about their uh, book in the Classroom Essentials series, A Teacher's Guide to Writing Workshop Essentials, Time, Choice, Response. Really focusing in on those three things. Yes, congratulations to you both on having the book out in the world um, for a while now. And I just want to get right to talking about it. You know, it is very focused on those three essentials, time, choice, and response. And, 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 and those are kind of big idea concepts. And yet I'm struck by how much incredibly practical support there is in the book. It's not, it's not a theoretical book, even though it's very grounded in the theory that that's what writers need. So I wonder if you could each just say which which practical part of the book are you most excited about and, and do you think will help teachers a lot? I love that question. Wow. Yeah, that's a great one. Catherine, do you want to go first? <laughs> well, I, aren't you sweet? I mean, I, I definitely have my cho- choice <laughs> okay. and I also have my choice for you. How about that? Okay. About okay. Taking away choice. No, <laughs> no. I, I think, well, okay. Let me just say that um, I think you helped so much in the time session because you were so, you know, deeply embedded in actual schools. You know, I, I, I'm, I don't have the opportunity of being in a school every day. Right. And you are in schools, multiple schools every day. And so you really are right in the heart of dealing with a school schedule and time and noticing what teachers have and feel that they don't have. And what are some of the answers for that in terms of crafting a special uninterrupted bubble of time that we call it in our book Mm -hmm. um, for writing. So does that feel like something you would like to talk about? Or have I totally taken away your choice? (laughs) No, I I do think that. um, Well, thank you for that, first of all. And I do think that time um, I was actually going to talk about um, the different ideas that we give them in terms of writing partnerships. That was actually the first thing oh, that came good. to my mind. Um, so if I could speak you that, can do that first too. and then I can circle back around to time, would that yes. be okay? Yes. Please. Um, the work that I ended the year in blue Springs this, um, spring was so centered on writing partnerships. And what I found is that they, um, there's a misconception that they are like peer editors And so then we have second graders who are trying to edit someone else's writing. And that doesn't really seem fruitful all the time. But then it also (laughs) um, it also gets to be a little bit deficit thinking in terms of, oh, well, I've got to pair things by pair people by ability. You know, I've got to have a low writer talking with a high writer. And when we think about it in terms of us correcting each other's work. And so we really what I'm so excited about and every time that I was in a classroom, I was like, man, I wish the book were out so I could give teachers these resources of just how to teach kids how to speak to someone as a partner within their writing. And I, so I really love that part of the book. And I feel like that's going to be really helpful to teachers as we start to um, continue to, you know, continue to grow our writing partnerships and, or to launch them. If you've never had kids write or talk to each other about their writing, um, I love the dialogue and the talking stems on in that part of the book. You, you know, and something I was thinking about in relation to this question too, is in the section on choice. I mean, you, I think you really open up the idea of all the different ways that kids can have choice. And it really got me to thinking about how 
how hard it is to teach writing as a process if kids don't have choices, right? If you just Mm -hmm. give them, if you just tell them Mm -hmm. what to do, there's nothing to teach into. And so Mm -hmm. really the heart of teaching the process of writing is giving kids choices. And I think it really illuminates that in a powerful way. Well, yes, our choice section is, uh, is rich. Uh-huh. <laughs> it is rich with possibilities. I mean, we just pushed on each other's brains and looked around at all the classrooms and just said, what are the m- multitudinous ways uh-huh. that we can give choice over to kids? And choice means more than just, I mean, the, the first thing to think about, of course, is the, is the utter importance of topic choice. Um, when kids are writing about what they want to write about, even if it's things that don't necessarily interest us as adults, as teachers, or things that we think are not really school appropriate, like um, video games, <laughs> when we let kids choose that to write about, it's as if you put them all on red, you all gave them Red Bull for a snack. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they suddenly are... Um, on fire to write. And that just makes sense that, you know, when you're writing about something that brings you joy, you're going to want to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we, but besides topic choice, we just found all these amazing different ways that kids make, um, make choices of where to sit and who to sit with and, and how to sit. (laughs) Um, I mean, literally some people are, some kids are on their bellies on the, on the floor. And then just um, choice being also, the ability to make decisions. So there's choice slash decision making. So making a decision of what genre do I want to write in? And if I'm writing a poem, for instance, do I want it to be all one chunk of of words, like one big block of of words. That's one c- way of that poems can look. Do I or do I want to put white space in between twenty different stanzas? I mean, they're just a million different decisions to make as a writer including when am I finished, you know? And so when you, in classic traditional classrooms, when you were handed a product, there was definitely a task, an assignment, right? And a time that you were supposed to be finished. I've just recently been going through boxes of old ancient pieces of paper from my mom's um, attic or <laughs> garage or something, I think. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, first of all, moved that she kept these pieces of student class work from all the way from kindergarten because they're really, really boring because (laughs) all they are is spelling words and handwriting practice over and over and over. And there's nothing to look at to see a person in there. I'm like, who, who was I when I was a child? All I was was copying and, um, and getting a grade on it. And so with, uh, with student writing, when choice is there, you just, you read student work and you feel like, I, I hear you. I see you. I, I can find a person inside there because you have the personality of the child there. I totally lost track of your initial question, Katie. No, well, I, I think I can circle it back around because what she said was, um, what I was struck when I felt like a, oh yes moment when you, when you were talking, Katie, was when you said, there's nothing really to teach into. When we make all the choices for the kids, then it's just an act of compliance. You know, I, can they follow directions is essentially what I'm assessing, not really um, tapping into their compositional thinking. And so I, that was the thing that struck me more than anything. And Catherine, all those handwriting sheets and things, you know, um, manuscript has a place in the world and everyone needs a John Hancock. However, if we're really talking about, um, compositional thinking that's not giving us intel that's not a formative assessment that's strictly just can they do it or can they not and no wonder you would shy i mean i would shy away from teaching writing if that's what i felt like my writing instruction was you know you know and you have this gorgeous ending um I'm the kind of writer who that really shines mm. a spotlight on these two young uh young boys who've Ugh. been co-authoring Jackson and Tate. And and really that, you know, choice is also the essence of a identity. If you don't have any choices, you don't have an opportunity to know yourself in that particular way. Exactly. Um, exactly. And it's it's really kind of what it all comes down to, isn't it? Is kids being able to walk away from this process with a sense of of who they are in the world when it comes to writing. So I think that's yes. really powerful. 
so the, the section on response is another really rich section because we talk about response being not only from the teacher in the form of conferring, but also from uh, peers in the classroom, the writing partnerships, and from certainly audiences that we can invite in through, um, you know, with celebrations of, of writing and also now, of course, we are learning so much about how to be online and sharing our writing online. We're going to have, you know, oh, so many kids are going to come into the classroom in August and say, I've got this. <laughs> I am sharing my writing to someone in Egypt. Right. And so I'm, I'm, I'm good with this. Um, but the conferring piece is I want to just give a nod to the books that have come before mine, um, both K Katie, your book with Lisa Cleveland, and also Carl Anderson's book on conferring and writing, and also Jen Saravalo's book on conferring and reading. So there is a lot of information and a lot of great resources out there about conferring. But one thing that I love about our book, um, the part about conferring, has wonderful videos attached to it um, for conferring and what I love about those videos is that I think that I would share those videos right now with the parents that I know who are trying to homeschool, the parents who are reaching out to me and saying, how do you do this? I'm having such respect for teachers now because I can't even, I mean, how do you talk to your kids about writing without showing them that they're not making, you know, that, that those, mm -hmm. they don't have periods in their writing, which is, mm -hmm. of course, what most adults think of when they think about talking to, to children about their writing. They think they've got to correct it, correct the spelling and make sure that they, they put their periods in capitals. And that's all super important, yes, but it is not how to talk to kids about writing. And so I think the videos in the book are really little um, visions for what conferring can look and sound like. And they they are about specifically they they show um, uh, the kind of tone that we want to have with our kids, the kind of leaning in and number one listening. You know, number the the number one thing to do when you're with a child who's writing is to listen to what they're saying about their writing um, and to ask how to ask open-ended questions like what are you working on in your writing talk to me about your writing um, and how to talk about kids writing process what they're thinking and the decisions they're making as they write rather than just going straight for you need paragraphs mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and that's a very hard it I, I have all empathy and understanding for that being the first thing that comes into your mind when you're with a child, because that's how we were all taught. And so, of course, it's the default position. But the I think the, the, the videos and the information that's inside the book around conferring is going to help people, help teachers and parents, if they want to check out the book, mm -hmm. uh, really know just how to just relax and, and lean in and listen to their children talk about writing. You know, and you mentioned, let's talk about the videos for a minute because uh, there are 15 videos uh, connected to this book, all of which um, captured in your district, Corinne. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, I was just looking at the overview. Really, only three, three of them are your exquisite conferences with children, uh, which, you know, every time I watch those, I just think I wish every child in the world could mm -hmm. sit next to you, Catherine. <laughs> and <laughs> Thank that you. kind of response. Thank um, you, Casey. But the other the other videos uh, are are different. They're not like the normal videos uh, that are you know that are attached to a book. We've got a you know a, a, a video that's about prioritizing time. Uh, we have one that's about the value of response. One about teaching into small group work. And can you just talk a little bit about your vision for the videos? What you hope they do? How they are different from sort of more traditional. Uh, videos about teaching? Well, I I don't know, Catherine, if feel free to jump in, obviously, but I just feel like so much of this, if I could just see it and I could see what was possible, then I could so much more easily translate it into my own classroom. And I think that that is the gift of how these videos are crafted. They are in the moment. They are real time. They give just such a strong... Um, I get, I don't know another word than visual of what this can look like within, when is it living and breathing within a classroom? What does it look like? And I think that- And um, across classrooms, that's one of the things that strikes me, right? It's not just a single classroom. It's you show routines yes, in action and, in kindergarten and routines in action in like fifth grade. 
Yes. And that it's so funny to me that uh, thank you for for highlighting that because I live in such a vertical world. I am constantly, you know, I could be in kindergarten in the morning and then third grade and then back to kindergarten and fifth grade and first grade. And so I live in a vertical world, but that is exactly that. (laughs) The gift of my job is embedded within those classrooms in terms of seeing things in and out of all different classrooms. And it also, what I love about the videos is that each of our teachers, you can feel a sense of continuity in what they are doing, but it is so individualized to who they are as teachers. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so I love the different, the ways that we've been able to capture that this, you can own this and it can look however you need it to look within your classroom and put your own stamp on it, but still knowing that you are valuing the principles of what we know to be true for writers. I think that's beautifully showcased within the videos. Mm -hmm. That's, I absolutely agree with that. That was uh, a real, um, going in, what we really wanted to include so many different styles, just so teachers know they can be themselves. Like, so we, we wanted to, for people watching the videos to know, oh, so I can be the kind of teacher who kind of stumbles over her words a little bit, or I could be the kind of teacher who feels completely, you know, um, Every every sentence that comes out of my mouth feels completely focused, and I, I mean th- that there that I'm I'm a well you can hear my own language how it stumbles a little bit, and I'm that kind of person when I speak out loud. And then, but there are other people who who don't talk like that, and that's okay. We all have our different personalities and styles of teaching, and we were trying to capture that. But also, the main thing about the videos that I want to say is that they are um, fun to watch. They're uh-huh. actually little <laughs> tiny mini. Ken Burns documentaries. They've got actually they're the actually track. they're Michael Grover documentaries. <laughs> yeah, of yeah. course. Thank you. Yay, Katie. Yeah, shout out to Michael, Michael Grover, the wow. wizard He's of uh, just, documentary oh. work at Heinemann. <laughs> he is. He's a magician. Um, but he uh, put together these, you know, from a ton of raw footage. But what we wanted when we what we knew we wanted was. Um, we have a couple that you could watch as just a straightforward mini lesson or a straightforward conference. And also there are ones that are more like that, that lay, that are like a, a vision of it. They're visionary. They're around big ideas. Um, like there's one about writing notebooks. And so you just get this vision and, you know, all, all the possibilities for what writing notebooks can be and look like along with a little bit of music in the background. Mm-hmm. And we've got, amazing teachers talking about their teaching. Oh my goodness. I mean, uh, I love their testimonials. We've got children talking oh, about their writing. The children's just, testimonials. Oh, oh. that mm-hmm. will melt your heart. Yeah. And all of that's put together in these very small, easy to digest and easy to watch mm-hmm. little movieettes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Another feature that I really appreciate in the book, you have spotlights on both um, beginning writers and also bilingual and multilingual writers. And um, I just, you know, what do you, what is it that you would most want readers to understand about those particular writers in their classrooms? Well, this, this was a big decision to add this um, feature into the book because we have to. Uh, there's nothing that I do in my work anymore that does not include or try to include everyone uh, in, who sits in our classroom. Um, that's just a mission in my life, and I know it's a mission in Corinne's life also. And so we wanted to make sure it was a part of the book. We make sure to give a nod or what we call take a bow to people who are more informed about um, teaching multilingual students than we are. But we also wanted to make sure that we can take, can again bring back to these foundational ideas and say, once again, these work for everyone. I, I, I will argue with anyone who says, but these kids can't or my kids can't because, you know, fill in the blank because they're this or they're that or we live here or we live there. Um, no, the answer is always time, choice and response. And so one thing we argue is that actually, one thing we know from research and experience is that people who are learning another language, uh, learning English as another language, need time. They need time to be using that language. And so in the writing workshop, they've, kids have time to both write and talk. 
a lot about their what they're working on. And that is going to help anybody learning English as another language. Kids, kids who have choice of what to write about and so feel comfortable writing about their, their uh, abuela or writing about whatever is important to them in their home life or, or, or their school life are going to feel more comfortable trying out English because they have the choice, right? And kids who have encouraging response through conferring and peers and audiences are going to just want to keep trying and wanting to do better and um, learning more than if we just handed them a worksheet and said, <laughs> I'm just going back to those mm-hmm. wrinkled, moldy papers I've been finding in these boxes. It's just these fill in the blanks with the correct phonetical word. I just, you know, it was okay for me. I managed to make 100s or 90s twos, but <laughs> that one made me cry. But um, <laughs> think about, you know, the difference between that, sitting in a classroom and doing that, or sitting in a classroom and being able to write about the party that you're having on Saturday with all your family coming over and 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 how you're going to celebrate together and being able to use um, words that you do know in your own language and that, that, that that's good and okay as far as learning language in the writing workshop. Yeah, and I would say that this is the most important part of the book in so many ways because this work is um, is universal. And just like Catherine said, you know, for the multilingual students, there feels a need to over scaffold. And when we over scaffold, we are not truly understanding what they are capable to do if we didn't scaffold. And there's a fear that if we don't, so we're like preemptively rescuing them, right? Like I'm going to give you the graphic organizer because I think it will make it easier for you. And I'm assuming that this is going to be what you need when really, when we engage the children with the time to tell us what they know. I mean, it is, and, and responding in a way that's not right or wrong. So many of uh, the, the kids in some of these settings feel as if they're not good at X, Y, and Z. And this work allows them to be successful in ways that perhaps they haven't had a chance to feel in other areas. So I think it's one of the most important parts of the book. Okay. (laughs) uh, One last question. This book is beautiful to look at. (laughs) It It is gorgeous. And and one of the most beautiful things is it's just filled with really exquisitely beautiful student writing. And it, it occurs to me when I just do sort of a flip through of that writing is that there's a message there, you know, there's, there's, there's something to take away from all the student writing in this book. And I just, I wonder in in your own words, what, what do you hope the message of all the student writing that I see in this book (laughs) is for readers? Can I say the first thing I want is for people to be delighted Mm. by student writing. We, the, the two boys that you talk about, Katie, at the very end, uh, Tate and Jackson, When Corinna and I first encountered the writing that they're talking about, these little tiny, teensy, tiny chapter books, I mean, they're just little teeny tiny, not even three by five size. And they were writing those on their own and by the dozens. And we we were, um, some teachers and I were standing in the light, the teacher brought them to the library and we were all standing around reading them to each other. And we were cracking up. We were, you know, adults after school reading students Mm. chapter books and cracking each other up. We were just delighted by the writing. And that's the first thing I would love people looking through this book and looking at the student writing is to just take delight in the humor the originality, the creativity, the the things that they write about that you would never in a million years think to write about. If we Mm -hmm. told them what to write about, never would we have anything as delightful as these little tiny chapter books that Tate and Jackson create. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the time savers, Catherine, is (sighs) you, you're you're done having to search for the cutest, newest thing because kids will not disappoint. <laughs> kids will always be more creative and have cooler things to say than whatever we can find. But this is what I want to say on behalf of the children. If the kids within these pages could talk to the audience, 
I think they would say things like this. We are here, we are capable, and we will knock your socks off given the opportunity. So just Ooh. get out of our way a little bit, you know, give yeah. us, give us these, um, honor the big principles and let us shine. That's, I feel like if the kids could talk, those are some of the things they would say. Oh, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. That. Well, thank you to again. Uh, thanks to you both. Congratulations to you both. It's a beautiful book. I'm just so happy to have it as a new, uh, classroom essentials book. I think it, absolutely fulfills the mission of these books, which is to uh, bring people into foundational work, remind people about what is foundational about the work they've been doing for years. So I'm just, I'm thrilled that it's out in the world. My thanks to Katie, Catherine, and Corinne for their time and expertise. Their book, A Teacher's Guide to Writing Workshop Essentials, is available from Heinemann.com. To view a transcript of this episode, download a sample chapter, and follow the authors on social media, visit blog.heinemann.com. The Heinemann Podcast is a production of Heinemann Publishing. It is produced and edited by Steph George. Sound mixing by Steph George. Our creative producer is Lauren Audette. And our executive producer is me, Brett Whitmarsh. To learn more about the Heinemann Podcast, visit blog.heinemann.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you.